So this is Good Friday, and I want to think about the meaning of this day. Jesus' death on the cross, as we've already heard in the scripture and the music, there's a big theological word for it, and that word is atonement. Some people have simplified it by making it at one meant, meaning getting us into a right relationship with God. I grew up in a family system that could be considered soft evangelical. By that, I mean, as many of you know, my father was a minister. Before he was in the United Church, he was in the Evangelical United Brethren Church. We joined with the United Church of Canada in 1966. I have uncles who were pastors in the Wesleyan Methodist Church, the Free Methodist Church. My dad's brother was a soloist with the Billy Graham organization. Uh, he died a couple years ago, Homer. And uh, we're distant cousins of George Beverly Shea, who sang almost every time before Billy Graham spoke. So at a very early age, I heard that Christ died for my sins that the blood of Jesus could wash away my sin. And atonement pretty much meant what we now call the ransom theory, and I'm going to talk about that more. Sometimes the substitutionary atonement theory, where that means that Jesus was a substitute for the penalty that we should have faced. Some years later in seminary, I heard a more expansive approach. It rejected a couple of those approaches. Uh, substitutionary atonement as a form of child abuse, a harsh God inflicting capital punishment on his own son. Well, over the years, I've uh, read some good theology. N.T. Wright, whom Newsweek says is the preeminent theologian of uh, our century. John Stott, they've got a book of his on the cross. And some of you will know I had a sabbatical about uh, 12 years ago now, and I read through a Methodist theologian, Tom Oden, and his theories about Jesus' death. And so added some new ideas, what in Latin is called Christus Victor, or Christ the Victor, and I'll explain that. And on, on Christmas season, we talk about the incarnation, about God coming in Jesus, experiencing life. Well, there's also a, a theory that Jesus experiences our suffering, and he does that on the cross. And a moral influence theory, and I'll, I'll explain all of those. But what I'm saying is it's sort of complicated to understand the meaning of Jesus' death. But I have a terrific illustration from my brother. He did it first that I'm going to use in a few minutes. Our grasp of Christ's death is always partial and limited. The God we're grasping for is complete and whole. So I want to think with you, what does the death of Jesus mean? Some scripture as a background. And scripture itself gives us a variety of answers. From 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul said... I hand it on to you as of first importance that which I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And Hebrews 9.15, for this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And Romans 3, this is a passage that uh, is pretty well known, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. So some interesting terminology going on. A mediator of a new covenant, a ransom, a sacrifice of atonement. Fact is that the scripture presents Jesus' death 
in a number of images. Self-giving love, forgiveness of enemies, payment of a debt, ransom of captives, victory over demonic powers and principalities, and more. The atonement is complicated because of the mind-numbing complexity of sin. There are so many ways that we are all broken, separated from God, from others, from our very best selves. I'll give you a couple of examples. Think of a young girl, grows up in a good home, good parents, good siblings, good friends. Somehow she wanders away from all of that goodness. After a decade or so of wandering, a failed marriage, a kid now perched on each hip, she returns home and discovers the grace and love that is waiting for her from God and her family. What image of atonement will work for her? Or take the 17-year-old suburban kid. Parents are well off. His needs have been met. His path is straight. Heading right through a good university back to the suburbs where he'll create a suburban cycle of comfort. What kind of savior does he need? I think he needs a savior who'll be a challenging role model who will inspire him to live beyond himself, beyond his own comfort, not just amuse himself to death, who will become a servant to others and to the world. Alistair McGrath, the theologian, called this that Christ our Savior is our moral influence. Or take the illustration of an immigrant mom from the Caribbean trying to raise her family in the Jane Finch area of Toronto. Guns and gangs dominate, poverty abounds. If you speak to her about sin, she'll tell you she is just overwhelmed by the violence and evil that threaten her and her family. Discrimination, criminal systems that control whole neighborhoods, even government social services that cannot overcome the generations of pain and despair. What kind of savior does she need? She needs someone who'll battle the forces of evil in this world, principalities and powers. Apostle Paul called them that control people. And the theologians call this Christos Victor, the God who faced violence, political oppression, prejudice, and systemic hatred, and came through it victorious. Christ the Victor is another image of God's atoning work in Jesus. What else? Well, think of all the people who've gone through terrible suffering in the oncology ward, in the hospice, in the torture cell of a terrorist group, in the extermination camp of the Nazis and their descendants, locked away in solitary. Our faith tells us that Jesus is present with every victim. He enters into the suffering of the world, personally comes into our human condition, experiences what we do in every way, and that ever since then, Christ's followers have felt that when they're suffering, when they're going through an earthly hell, the mystical Jesus is with them. We never suffer alone. So those are some images and theories to help understand what God achieved in the heroic death of Jesus. And I think those of us in the United Church have been wise to diversify our understanding of the meaning of Jesus' death to these various ways of thinking about it. It's sort of like a set of golf clubs. <laughs> now, I want to say that I'm a, at best, mediocre golfer, and there's quite a few people here who will testify to that. <clears throat> but let's imagine for a moment that uh, 
we're playing a par five. I, I'm going to explain this carefully for the non-golfers, okay? 500 yards, which means you get five swings to get this little white ball, 500 yards, and in a little four-inch cup. Now, that's pretty hard to do, right? So to start out, I take out my driver. This is the biggest one, right? And I, I go up and I hit the ball. I haven't ever done this with a roll on. But I hit it 225 yards. Now, that's a pretty good drive. And some people here can attest, I can do that if I hit a good shot. <laughs> right, David? Thank you. What they'll also attest is it doesn't always go straight. <laughs> so it goes 225 yards, but I have something called a slice, where it goes off to the right, and it gets into some long grass that's called the rough. So then I need something sometimes called a rescue club. It's a lot smaller, you see. It's got more of a loft on it. So it'll get in there, and it'll hit, pick, the up, pick the ball up. Now, the problem is it's in some sort of longish grass. I can't get it that far. So this time, I only hit it 150 yards. How far are we away? 225, 150? 375, so I still have 125 yards to go. And I've already taken two shots. Well, fortunately, I have right here a nine iron, which if I hit it nicely, it'll go 125 yards, sometimes even more. But I'm just going to hold up a little bit on it, and I'm going to hit my nine iron, and it's going to go 125 yards. The problem when I hit my nine iron sometimes is it doesn't always go at the pin. This one goes to the bunker of the golf course. So now I'm in a bunker. That's a big sand trap, okay? I hate it when that happens. But I do have something. This is now the fourth club I've used called a sand wedge. You see the loft on that? So I go there and I get underneath the ball and it floats up and it lands about six feet from the flag. David Payne is now gagging. <laughs> so is Tony. I can see him in the back there. Somewhere. I don't know what this thing is. I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm just, it's confusing me. I'm stuck. Yeah, never mind. So now I'm six feet from the flag. And I'm using my fifth club, it's called a putter, and there I go and I hit a perfect putt and it falls in the hole and I've used, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I've used five clubs and got it in 500 yards into the hole. Toneman's theories are sort of like that. We shouldn't limit God to one image. Now, I know not everybody likes golf. As a matter of fact, there was a Scottish woman who went to the local newspaper. She wanted to publish the obituary for her recently deceased husband. So the obit editor said, well, there's a charge of 50 cents a word. Being a good Scottish woman, she said, well, then let it read, Angus McPherson died. Amused at her thrift, the obit editor said, well, you got to have seven words. She paused again. In that case, let it read, Angus McPherson died golf clubs for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get rid of the clubs, they're sold. We uh, need different ways of understanding Jesus' death. Let me give you another example. Consider a man who goes through a dangerous period in his life. Increasingly successful in his business, he's also increasingly reckless in his personal lifestyle, drinking heavily, unfaithful to his wife, distant from his children. His marriage is headed on the rocks. 
His wife and his daughters have been active in the church life, but he never attended. One Saturday evening after several martinis, a couple of beers thrown in, his 10-year-old daughter pleads with him to come to church the next day because their group is singing at the service, and he reluctantly agrees and regrets it the next morning, but he had promised, so he went. And in that service, for the first time in his life, he hears that he was a guilty sinner who needed salvation, that Jesus had taken his sin on the cross, and it all comes clear to him, and he pleads with God to take away his own burden of shame, and his life takes a brand new direction. Well, a couple years ago, Barb and I heard a speaker down at Chautauqua called Richard Mao, and I've read a number of his things, and I appreciate his summary on the meaning of Jesus' death. Mao said, our burdens of shame and guilt have been nailed to the cross. A variety of images capture this emphasis. Debt repaying, ransom, sacrifice, enduring divine punishment against sin. All these images have one thing in common. Jesus did something for us that we could never do for ourselves as sinners. He engaged in a transaction that has eternal consequences for our standing before a righteous God. So we stand before a righteous God and for a long time in the ancient world, people believed that before they would come to God, they had to sacrifice an animal, but that was never what God really required. And in Micah 6, verses 6 to 8, he says, with what shall I come before the Lord? Shall I come before him? I'm skipping some slides, Kathy. Skipping two. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with my thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of the body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The early Christians, the first ones, got this. They understood that God wants mercy and kindness and humility and right living. No need anymore for blood sacrifices. And even those who believed in some of the ancient traditions in, in the Hebrew uh, faith began to interpret Jesus' death as the final sacrifice. Hebrews puts it this way. Now he has appeared once and for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and then the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. So God had a permanent solution in Jesus. And with Jesus' death on the cross, the first Christians saw continuity with what came before. And this is acted out, and we'll do it in a few moments, at the Last Supper. Matthew records that Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant that's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's part of an understanding that we call a transaction, a substitution. Sinners ought to have been crucified, and Christ takes our place. He's there in our place. And there's another image, a transaction, sometimes called the ransom theory. Jesus spoke of it himself. I don't have a slide for this. In Mark's gospel, he said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's a pretty clear illustration. And that helps me out personally, because uh, Ransom is something you pay to kidnap or to free someone who's imprisoned. And I did a series of sermons here a couple of years ago called The Seven Deadly Sins. I think most of us at times are prisoners to some of those at least. Ego, pride, laziness, selfishness, gluttony, greed, lust, anger. Did I miss any? You know what the drift is here. We're all in the same boat. We need someone to rescue us, to pay the ransom. Set us free. Well, the first 
Christians, the rookies, 2,000 years ago, heard from Peter, who said this, you know that you were ransomed, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. The great uh, British theologian N.T. Wright has summarized it all. He said, on the cross, Jesus the innocent one was drawing onto himself the holy judgment of God against human sin. So that human sinners like you and me can find, as we look at the cross, that the load of sin and guilt we've been carrying is taken away from us. No trivial God could accomplish that. It takes holiness for something that big. Holiness to reconcile all things, from our individual souls to the farthest reach of creation. Only a God different from humanity, outside the world of self-centeredness, has the power to reverse the deathly order of things, and only a God who has a passion not to be separated would go to the extremes necessary to cancel sin and put death itself to death. One last thing to imagine. Courtroom scene. The accused has been convicted of a terrible crime. The judge has to uphold the law, honor the demands of justice, and so declares the sentence of death. But then, almost unimaginable, the judge announces that he or she themselves will take the place of the condemned, bear the burden and responsibility of guilt, and will die. The truth of the criminal's wrongdoing is not ignored, but a sacrificial offering deals with it. Essentially, that's what Scripture says happens through Jesus, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, was the one by whom the fullness of sin was put to death. The absolute darkness that we ultimately deserve, the death that's essentially separation from God, was accepted already on our behalf by the one who cries with his last breath, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the Trinity, one God in three forms, united in love. John Stott explains it this way, the biblical gospel of atonement is God satisfying himself by substituting himself for us. Charles Wesley had it exactly right. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Let's pray. It is only in your amazing love of God that our sins are covered through the death of Jesus. We have different ways of understanding this, but ultimately our response is gratitude and the commitment of our hearts to you this day and every day. Amen.